right, so we've now finished the CTF correction, which we see the results show up in this directory called CTF stacks. And again, I only ran it for tilt series one. You'll have tilt one and tilt two. And you notice in addition to the li1, we now have a CTF tossed in there before the uh, dot fixed. All right, so what we need to set up to move forward, we uh, if you hadn't already done this, you need to create a link to the cumulative convolution map, the template matching results directory that's simply called convmap. And again, you can do that with ln with the s flag, and then you would put it in this folder followed by what you want to call it. Now I already have that link there. And in my case, because I'm ignoring uh, the first tomogram, I changed this name that ends in path, and I just turned it into a backup file by putting this little tilde at the end. And what that causes is in the next step, EM Clarity will ignore it. So it's going to assume that I only want to work with this tomogram number two. So if maybe you looked at the template matching results and it just looked junky or the CTF correction revealed something that you didn't like. Basically, you want to remove it from consideration. Okay. So I've taken care of that. And the next thing that we want to do will, of course, as we've done before, open up the parameter file and point out the relevant details. So we're going to go the whole way up to the top now. And this is something that now comes into play. This subtomo meta is basically what that means is just the binary file that stores all the data about your subsequent experiments. And you give it some name that can have numbers, underscores, and letters, and that's it. No other special characters, and it needs to start with a letter. You might change this name in the middle of processing, and then what you have to do is there's a file that will start with this and end with a dot mat. That's just the suffix used for the binary MATLAB files. Uh, that way you can experiment with different, condi uh, different conditions where all the output will then have this name included in it. So say I wanted to test out a different set of parameters that was significantly different, I might just call this Reliant Tutorial 2. Then all the maps that are generated, all the curves, everything that's printed out will have that suffix. So that way you can stay in the same directory and experiment and play a little bit without uh, getting things tangled up. So up till now we've had to keep track of a decent amount of things, but from here, once we enter the EM Clarity workflow, everything is kept track of in this binary file for you. There shouldn't be anything else we need to change at this point, so we'll close the file. Now we're just going to run EM Clarity. The command is init for initialize, and all we need to give it is the parameter file, and we'll send that job off and check back when it finishes. Okay, so that's run, and it basically just spit test some things as it's going, where the total number of subtomograms we've asked for now are 800. You'll have 1600 if you've done two of the tilt series. And now it's time to create the initial average. So before we do that, we'll just list the directory contents. Here's that map file I was talking about, and you see it's prefixed by our experiment name. And so now we're just going to run EM Clarity again and give it the command average, pass in the parameter file the cycle number which we start indexing from zero, and the stage of alignment. So this stage of alignment can be a number of things. Um, after cycle zero, it's called raw alignment instead of no alignment. You can extract during class averaging and some other complicated parameters, but for now we'll just worry about no alignment, and then subsequent we'll just use the same thing. We'll increment the cycle number, and instead we'll pass raw alignment. So let that run, and then we'll check back after it averages. And you'll notice here that it's actually running through, it's binned our CTF corrected stack. And then from there it's calling imod and running our reconstruction internally on that bin data. So we're working at a binning of four, which I think I forgot to mention when we set up our tilt, um, our parameter file, we changed the sampling to four. So remember we ran the template matching at a binning of six. Uh, we don't need to go that course now in the template matching, so we'll start out at a binning of four. And once this finishes running, I'll reopen that parameter file and show you where that's at. And it just prints out as it's going, you know, it's now working on the second volume. If you had multiple GPUs, these would be printing out in parallel to your log file. Uh, and it also puts out all the details. So this is the command that's actually passed to imod when it's running the reconstruction. So there's some interesting details in it that you might want to look at whenever you're running. So I've run down through the bottom. It's running the FSC calculation right now. So here's where it used Chimera to calculate the alignment between the two half sets. These are the actual numbers, but there'll be a curve that prints out, so you don't have to actually look at these. Uh, we'll take a look at the results here in just a second, as it's just about done running. Okay, and it's just about finished applying the 
adapted single particle Wiener filter, so we've got a handful of things. We see we now have this FSC directory, which I'll change into. And or not, there we go. So there's a bunch of files put out here. All we really want to look at, we can look at a couple files. So we'll look at this FSC gold. So if you had run with a shape based mask, there'd also be one called FSC Rand that shows you what would happen if you had run and put that mask against randomly sampled data to make sure that the mask, which in no case is going to introduce a correlation. So this is our FSC curve after the template matching results are run. And you can see importantly that although we did our low pass to 40 angstroms, there is some correlation beyond that, which we would expect because the signal is coherent. But this tells us that before we split the half data set, they're independent to around 34, 35 angstroms uh, at most, and really that is even a bit of a um, stringent condition. So that tells us that things are looking good. We haven't inadvertently introduced a strong correlation between the two half sets, and we can proceed with the gold standard phase process. All right, other files have been generated. So we've got these things that are prefixed cycle 00, zero. then our project name. Class 0 just means there's no classes. So if there had been different class averages, they would have numbers. Uh, and then we've got our even and odd half sets. The no weight is the raw subtomogram average, with the exception of a quality weight that will apply in subsequent rounds. The weight is the cumulative CTF that's added up for that given set, and that's used to then create the final weighted average, which we can take a look at for the odd half set here by opening it in Chimera. see it's pretty rough. Alright, well it's good that I'm making all these mistakes. So the reason that looked so weird is I'm guessing that I had still applied symmetry. So opening up our parameter file again, we'll scroll down a little. So here's where we change the sampling array. So we've got no alignment, PCA, classification, raw alignment, and then some other things that we'll talk about in other videos, but just change them all at this point to four. Um, and then if we scroll down to the class reference and alignment section, in the no alignment prefixed parameters, you see the zero, which is for the class, and this number here indicates the symmetry. So I should have changed that to one because the ribosome, of course, doesn't have symmetry. Uh, the next, everything below that is for the classes, which we're not gonna worry about classification right now. So I'm gonna scroll down a little bit further to the ones that are prefixed with raw, and that just means against the raw individual subtomograms. And you see I do already have the symmetry set to 1 there, so it's okay and I'll leave it. Um, and we'll go back and I'm going to rerun that averaging again and we'll take a look at the results when it's done. Okay, that's finished running again, so we'll take a look at these results and they should look a little bit more like a ribosome with any luck. Okay, it's still ugly, but it's much better than it was. So we do have something that looks a little bit like a blob. And again, this is only from a very few in a course round of template matching. So um, I think that looks about good enough to move forward. All right, so one more feature about the averaging. Now, this is only done in the initial cycle zero. A directory called initial tomo averages is produced. And this is one more final check where you can go through and look at the average that's produced from each tomogram. That way, you have an idea, you know, if one tomogram happens to be particularly off for some reason, uh, then you would be able to eliminate it at this point as well. So we can take a look. There's tomogram one and two. You can see the averages are pretty similar, like they should be. Um, so we're going to go ahead and keep all of our tomograms. Again, that was in the initial tomo averages directory. And then from there, we're ready to move on to an initial round of alignment. So let's set that up. So we'll go back to our parameter file. And down, this is where we just left off checking our symmetry, our raw peak search. So I'm going to set this to 64 pixels. So again, these are all going to be in pixels. And our diameter is about 80. The peak search doesn't need to be quite as big, so that's just used for the translational search. Um, and the center of mass, three, 3 to 5 pixels is fine. Um, and that's just a refinement for subpixel accuracy for the translational alignment. This fifth parameter, as in template matching, is not relevant. It's for an in-plane symmetry to constrain the search. 
and since we're dealing with the C1 symmetry with Rabs, then we don't need to worry about that. So for this initial round, let's do a plus or minus 12 degrees in three degree increments. Actually, yeah, three is fine. And we're not going to do any out of plane search. So the biggest thing after template matching really is going to be the translational refinement because we're going from a binning of six down to four and now we're comparing individual sub volumes against each other. So things should um, align a little better. So one thing that you can do is you can always specify an out of plane and in plane search. So searching all three Euler angles exhaustively. But what we can do in EM Clarity, uh, it's much more efficient once you get to having a reasonable structure to simply do alternates of in plane and out of plane. So for the next cycle, we might do plus or minus 12 degrees out of plane, but not specify any in plane search. And it will still come in and do an in plane refinement after it searches around all the, the increment in the azimuthal angles and the out of plane angles here. And what that basically does is it rapidly, it helps things converge maybe a little bit slower in terms of the number of iterations you need, but each iteration is substantially faster because you're not searching. So if we did 12 by three by 12 by three, that would be an additional, um, let's see, eight times as much search range because you'd search eight in plane angles for every out of plane tilt you would have. So we can split these up and alternate. So in cycle one, we're gonna run 12, three out of plane. So we've got zero and zero for the out of plane and then 12-3 running in plane and then we would just swap those numbers to run a negative 12 to 12 out of plane and a three degree increment by putting them in the first two positions in cycle one but for cycle zero we'll just do this so we're set up to run we're going to call em clarity apply in raw give it the parameter file and our cycle which is zero and we'll set that off and it will run and we'll be good after this finishes running, you'll then create a new average, this time running EM Clarity average parameter file, and now you're giving it cycle one. And instead of no alignment, for all subsequent iterations, you're going to type raw alignment, capital R-A-W, and then alignment. And it'll, again, give you the same things, an FSC, a raw volume, the cumulative CTF, and then the reweighted volume based on the adapted single particle Wiener filter. Um, and then you can change your angular search range from there and play around with how you get it to converge. One other thing I'll point out that it's saying right here, I have an option set to refine the center. So it shifts the center of each reference. You can see they're pretty similar numbers, but a little different based on the center of mass. And what that helps to do is to keep the, um, the rotations centered specifically on the center of mass so that your search is as good as you can get. It also prints out some information. Here's the actual in-plane search we're doing, so negative 12 to 12, and there's no out of plane, so that would show up in the angle step and the subsequent lines here. Um, and it tells you it's reweighting it, and it'll go through, and it'll print out as it aligns, and you're gonna see it's pretty fast, the results it's finding. So you're giving a pre-initial and a pre-refine. If we were doing an out of plane search, it would be a post-refine line as well. That gives you your starting condition, which is always going to be zero zero zero, the cross correlation coefficient at that position, and then the translational shift. So it does a translational search, and then it applies that and calculates the cross correlation value. Then it does the rotational search and comes back and then applies that translation again. So you see, for many of these, they're shifting by three and six degrees. None of them, it seems like, are going a full twelve. Uh, the translational shifts in x, y, and z are pretty large. So we've got two about two to three pixels on average in each of these dimensions and remember we're at a binning of four so that's actually you know four to six pixels at two angstroms so it's good to think of it in terms of absolute spatial dimensions rather than just pixels sometimes so if you had numbers that were shifting by very large amounts that would be something to worry about uh, and we can talk about that in more detail in some troubleshooting guides in the written documentation uh, so you can see that's cooking through pretty quick and you'll be able to iterate through that and after this and arrive at a good map. Alright, thanks.